to fall If you're conscious and awake and wait, You know that the studio gets deep Black news and history in the making man. Let's get up from the fall Wise up and take it all All right, all right. Peace and Black Power family. Welcome to another Sarnetta TV House of Consciousness production. You already know what it is. We got Rashida in the building, and she's bringing a strong and powerful king up in the building with her. Uh, uh, actually, a native, a native to Haiti. And uh, we're going to get into it. We're going to find out some things here. We're going to deal with the dark skin because we really need to get into this stuff. We see a lot of things going on all around the world. We see the police cracking down on black people when we all should be having the same rules as, but hey, this is not no, um, we, we not surprised by this. We, we know this already, you know what I'm saying? The police is cracking down on black people, but they are giving masses out to Europeans but they giving the handcuffs to the black people if you don't follow this new rules and laws that's going on. So this is not new to us, all right? So um, I'm glad to welcome the sister back. This is not once, not twice, not three times, but she is here again. Peace and black power to you, my sister. How are you doing? Unmute yourself, unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. We hear you. All right. Good. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you very much, um, Sonetta, for having us here. I'm very happy and very honored to be back on the platform again. Like you said, this ain't my first rodeo. I was here twice. I did a one-on-one -on -one with you uh, with a theory of darkism, a global darkism. And then we did the debate with the light skinned sister and myself and uh, back in 2017. So it was a fantastic time and I'm back again. So thank you very much. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that something that you brought up yesterday that's very important um, in terms of Santo Domingo, the, the Dominican Republic, that you as a, a person that's from there, your family is from there, y'all are brothers and sisters. The Haitians and the Dominicans, y'all are brothers and sisters. And it wasn't y'all fault that the Spanish who originally came over to um, control the island, Columbus came over there and so-called discovered it in 1492. Um, the French wanted a piece of the action. They went to war and that's how you get the Spanish control of the Dominican Republic. And then you get the French control of um, what, what we now call Haiti. Um, actually that's the original name. But, um, you know, I want to acknowledge y'all kinship. That's very, very important. And you pointed that out. So I definitely want to acknowledge that. And I kind of want to get into that a little bit because there's a lot, there's some darkism there too, in terms of the um, later on, the economic, the political and economic structure of uh, the Dominican Republic being more economically and politically stable than Haiti. And we know that, as, as brother Kevin, he gonna tell us about, there was a majority of African dark skinned slaves that came over to Haiti as opposed to the Spanish intermarrying with the natives that were already there. And so you had less Africans, dark skinned, pure black Africans, you had more of a mixed race. And I think that probably had a lot to do with the, you know, the darkism, this, what I call systemic economic darkism. So we are gonna go ahead and get into it. I have, our very distinguished brother here. Um, his name is King Kevin Dorable. And uh, some of y'all that may have been following my channel, y'all know that he's came on before and he spoke on the great work that he does. He's a three-time author. One of his books is The Courage to Believe, which is an amazing book. He has an excellent story of overcoming. Uh, this brother is from Haiti, or I'm, I'm sorry, of Haitian descent, should I say. And um, you know, just pulled himself up from the bottom off the streets, got his uh, bachelor's degree in political science, started writing books, started uh, engaging in community activism and has done so many great things. And I ran across a video that he did on uh, Haiti's situation, Haiti's economic situation. I call it systemic economic darkism. And that is sort of what got us here tonight to speak on this because 
I want to expose the situation of the the very first Black Republic. We gotta we gotta say shout out to Haiti for that. We I think we owe a great debt of uh, gratitude because those dark skinned slaves Africans put it down. And so without further ado, I want Kevin King, Kevin Dorable, and you can go to his website at kevindorable.com and find out more information about this brother. I want you to take the floor and just give us your story, your background, your history. It's amazing. Y'all get ready. Yeah, bless, right, up, you good. bless up, bless up, King Kevin in the building, baby. Um, thank you, Sarnetta, for letting let me on your show. Um, definitely shout out to the queen for giving us the opportunity to connect. I've um, been watching your show for many years now, um, you know, kicking knowledge. I learned so much over the years, so definitely keep that going. As um, far as me and my story, my family, uh, we are um, Haitian. Um, my, both parents are from Haiti. Um, uh, Cap Haitian or Cap Haitian, some people would say it. Ocop, if you're, if you're Haitian, that's the northern part. That's actually the, the area where the, the, the last battles against the French took part. Actually, there's a big statue in Haiti. Um, I got a chance to, you know, take a picture next to it. Um, of course, I, I know my history as far as our people coming from West Africa, the homie, which is now been in. And, um, you know, me knowing my history is what really got me started calling myself king or people calling me king because I refuse to see myself as someone less than um, a king or a leader once I understood what the, first of all, what the Haitians and the Haitian Revolution were able to do. And even going back, it, even further with the African kingdom of, of the Homie, which was one of the power, most powerful kingdoms in West Africa. And as she mentioned, I wrote a couple of books, three books, uh, The Courage to Believe, um, Inspirational Autobiography. Uh, I, I talk a, a lot about Haiti in the first chapter, which is called The Royal Bloodline. So I, I got a lot of compliments about that chapter. Uh, second book, Seven Tax of Queens, King Desire, um, which is taking me all over the world. I even spoke in Haiti uh, when, when that book was released back in 2017. And my next book, which is coming out, The Winner in the Mirror, Activating Your Superpowers, Mind, Body, and Spirit. Of course, um, you know, check out my books uh, on my website, kevindorable.com. Um, now, now that's out the way. So me being able to pull myself up my own bootstraps, being able to, you know, despite the racism that goes on in South Florida, I was born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, um, just north of Miami. And um, I just, I seen a lot. Um, and being Haitian, we had to fight. <laughs> we had a lot of fights back then, you know what I mean? We, like, we had to gain our respect because, you know, the Americans um, were very ignorant um, due to the fact they were brainwashed to think, okay, because you're black and speak differently, you know, you're an enemy of ours. So there's a lot of Haitian American wars that took part. Some of them got a little, you know, bloody, you know, uh, truth be told, you know, gun, like gun started getting involved. And, um, you know, you got groups like Island Boys, um, which, you know, very prevalent in, in Miami area, who was not only, you know, a gang, but also big dope dealers. So that helped us get a lot of rank back, you know, in South Florida, and it just spread all over Florida and throughout the United States. Now, Haiti, my passion with Haiti and what Queen Rashida just mentioned, the video she's talking about is called on my YouTube, um, Haiti is Rich and filled with gold. Um, and, it, and it talks about how the Clintons robbed Haiti, literally robbed Haiti, legally robbed Haiti, let's just say that, um, of, of everything um, from, you know, even stole our spirits. You know, the Clintons from uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton, they came to Haiti um, acting, acting as if they were the saviors. You already know how Europeans do it. They come to any country, oh yeah, the white man's here, everything's gonna be good. We all saved now, you know, we all, that was far so far from the truth because if you if, if you monitor you know history even going for instance what happened in the Congo with with the king of Belgium you know he came you know they, they first of all they divided um, the continent and and Belgium you know King Leopold or King Leo told went and um, pillaged Congo um, and had, gave it everybody the whole world a perception that he's there to help the Congolese become civilized people. You follow what I'm saying? Um, but the Clintons did the same thing, but they were part of a much bigger scale because what they did was back in 2010, they they claimed it was an earthquake, which really wasn't a natural earthquake. This was a man-made earthquake that the Clintons and whoever else they inspired, uh, uh, you know, conspired with. I wouldn't even doubt it with, with the French as well, but the French has always been in, in the pockets of the Haitians. 
um, of our people and literally shook up, you know, the, the, the continent. And a lot of people think like, oh, how are you going to say that? You know, why would you even think or um, come up with the idea that, you know, the, the earthquake was man-made? But look at it. Dominican Republic wasn't shaken at all, if I'm not mistaken. So you got li literally almost 300,000 people died on an earthquake, uh, you know, size seven on the Richter scale, shaken up. Um, but the, the, the DR is peaceful, you know what I'm saying? So that goes to show that this was this was strategized, it was planned, and they use this, this software called HARP. Um, HARP stands for, and I try to memorize that, but High Frequency Active um, Area Program. It's, it's a military program that they use, you know what I'm saying? And they and and, and when you use and you only use HARP, not only, I don't know what else these people are using it for, but you mainly use HARP when you're searching for treasure and oil. So you shake up the ground so, so it's easier to search what you, you know, to, to you know, when you're digging through the, through the, the coal mines or through the caves in the ground, it, it makes the, the soil or the rocks easier to, you know, um, punch through, so to speak. So by them doing that, that's what caused the earthquake. And now you got the clear ends and the, the first, uh, what do you call the uh, for, uh, Holy Cross, Red Cross, who, who nothing but blood suckers anyway. Um, for some reason, President Obama puts uh, George Bush, you know, in a leadership position to help with um, this tragedy. How can you do that when he failed horribly with Katrina? So the, the whole thing with Haiti and the racism that you told our people, um, you know, it's, it's made for not just political um, purposes, but it's, fi it's for financial gain. Slavery, I don't care where it was, whether it was in the plantations of the United States, uh, the, the continent of the United States, or in the Caribbean, whether it be Jamaica, Bahamas, wherever, slavery has always been more than a moral issue. We obviously can see killing, raping, um, castrating, you know what I'm saying, lynching, all that, that's bad and wrong. Of course that's wrong, we, we know that. But it's the financial component of it that's really the, the spirit behind slavery, especially chattel slavery. And so right. for them to be able to for years and, 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 and hundreds of years get away with it, they naturally feel as if they have the right to um, you know, enslave our people, you know what I'm saying? So that's why I'm so proud to be Haitian because Toussaint Louverture, Jean Jacques Dessalines, Henry Christophe, those generals right there, which all black nations, you know, all black nations, I don't care where you're from, it, you could be in the motherland, you know what I'm saying? We owe a great deal of gratitude to the Haitian soldiers who put it all on the line. As a matter of fact, we need soldiers like that right now. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm a reincarnation of Tucson Louverture. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because I understand what needs to be done and what's been happening. And like Tucson, who's highly intelligent um, and seen racism from, from all components, I mean, Tucson was not just an ordinary man. As a matter of fact, if any of you guys read uh, Marcus Garvey's book, it's an autobiography. I have it right here. That then who don't have it. The uh, life and lessons of, of Marcus Garvey. You re open it up and read page three. If you guys don't mind, can I read page three? It's only like two sentences, right quick. Oh, I already got it. I already got a bookmark. Um, and and he and he says this. I'm, but I'm gonna start what he says about um, Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth is worthy of the place of sainthood alongside Joan of Arc, Crispus Attucks and George Williams Gordon are entitled to the halo of martyrdom with no less glory than those of the martyrs of any other race. Toussaint Louverture, brilliancy as a soldier and statesman outshone that of a Cromwell, Napoleon, and Washington. Hence, he is entitled to the highest place as a hero among men. You hear what I'm saying? Marcus Garvey is the, the, the father of Pan-Africanism. For him to say that and give that kind of honor to, to Tucson literature and the Haitian Revolution, that just tells you what type of person that, that, that we're dealing with, we're giving homage to. As a matter of fact, if you're in a Black History program and you're not talking about Marcus Garvey, if it's a Black History program or, or Black History course, whatever you want to call it, if you're not talking about Marcus Garvey, and definitely, if they're not talking about Tucson literature or the Haitian Revolution, it is a whitewash program funded by the, the oppressors. There's no doubt about it. If you're not, if they're not talking about Tucson or the Haitian Revolution, I'm walking out of the classroom or, or I'm <laughs> stop reading because it, there's no point of reading it because this, what they did, they won the war against all odds. 
This was a war against, they was not supposed to win this battle, but they defied the odds and beat them anyway. And I'm not just talking about some ringy dean country. They beat French, who was the U.S., who's equivalent to the U.S. powers, military powers of today. Toussaint beat Napoleon Bonaparte, which was the French general. For him to beat him, it that and, and, and the white historians, they titled Napoleon Bonaparte as the world's greatest military strategist. So that's just racism right there because if Toussaint beat the greatest, what that makes Toussaint? Right. <laughs> Does that make him any less because he's black? In their eyes, it is because a lot of historians in the books we read, the, you know, m most of them um, are written by racist individuals anyway, or just they don't know that they're racist. They're just belligerent. But Tucson, by all means, needs to be included in all black history programs, classes, and books. There's no doubt about it. And the reason why they don't want us to know about Tucson, they don't want us to know about Jean Jacques Dessalines and Henry Christoph, is because they want to keep us thinking that we were okay with slavery. As a matter of fact, even back then, Nat Turner. Now, Turner read about Tucson. He was already inspired to start a revolution anyway. He read about Tucson and the Freedom Land, because Haiti at that time was on this Freedom Land. If you were able to escape the plantations of you know, the United States or wherever you come from, if you were able to escape and get to Haiti, you were automatically set free. And when the plantation owners find that out from around the world, they stop all boats that are coming from Haiti or the Caribbean coming to their country. And to check if you had any literature, anything written about it, they didn't want nobody reading anything or even talking about it because Toussaint Louverture and Nat Turner represents the white man's nightmare. And that's, uh, that's I just kind of want to say that right there. You go ahead, Queen. I, know I can go on and on. <laughs> I love it. No, I'm, I love it. So powerful opening, man. Powerful, powerful Absolutely. opening, man. We gotta hear, we gotta hear more from you in, in a minute. Go ahead, my sister. Take it yes. away. I love it. I love it. Um, so you, yeah, you, that was a powerful opening. And so um, the thing, this is what I would like to do because I wanna look at this from the framework of, of darkism. And darkism comes out of um, a movement I started called dark skin activism, which is a movement to equalize dark skin people politically, economically, and socially around the world. And so in doing so, I studied the colorism scholarly literature, which deals with skin tone discrimination of all black people, whether light skin, brown skin, um, dark skin, it doesn't matter. And what I found is something missing from the research that there wasn't a focus, a laser sharp focus on dark skin people and how dark skin people who are in the majority, as, as, as we know in Haiti, they were the majority, uh, are discriminated against around the world. And so I came up with this concept of darkism, which is also the name of my book, Darkism. And darkism simply means the discrimination of dark skinned people. And if you want to compare it to colorism, again, colorism focuses on all skin tones of black people, whereas darkism hones in on dark skin discrimination. And again, it does it in a multifaceted way. And so, um, uh, me, and, me and King Kevin, we both share degrees in political science. He has a, a bachelor's degree in political science. I have a master's in political science from the University of South Florida. And while I was studying, I did my thesis on the dark skinned people of Sierra Leone. And so mm -hmm. the goal has always been to focus on uh, dark skinned people globally in different parts of the world and analyze darkism and just keep expanding that out. That's why Kevin and being from Haiti is so important to me because it's an expansion, a continuation of the analyzation of darkism of dark skinned people around the world. So with that being said, darkism, uh, it, it, again, is the discrimination of dark skinned people all around the world. And there's this concept, uh, a, a phrase that I created called systemic economic darkism which means that dark skinned people's economics, their personal economy and their um, collective economy is impeded. And we see it happened in Sierra Leone, just to throw out an example with the civil war in Sierra Leone, the 10 year civil war, blood diamonds, the, the wow. International Monetary Fund and the World Bank coming over there 
and strangle holding them economically and saying, you got to do this or we're not going to give you no money, yet depleting their natural resources. Same thing. So they, they come over, uh, the, the, uh, the Spanish, uh, they come over uh, and take over Hispaniola, make it Hispaniola and divide it up with the, you know, Europeans always fighting each other over resources. So they come over, you got the Spanish and the French fighting each other. They divide up Hispaniola and you get Haiti. You got Haiti on one end and you got the Dominican Republic on one end. So with Haiti, you have the three groups there, which the white folks was in the minority. Then you have the mixed race and that the dynamic of the mixed race people in terms of darkism is super interesting because um, as I'm sure uh, Kevin can point out, it was fighting going on between the mulattoes and the dark-skinned Africans and all these allegiances was going all over the place. But at the end of the day, the majority was the African slaves mm. who were being brutalized and forced to um, engage in slavery. Sugar was at the heart of it. The sugar, and that's, that's very important with the systemic economic darkism because the French used Haiti as just using them for economic gain. They didn't go in and build any infrastructure. They just wanted to extract the money out of them, the resources out of them and force the dark skinned people to do it, especially with the production of sugar, which is so important. And so I'm looking at this through the eyes of darkism simply because in Haiti, the majority of the people, the, of the slaves rather were dark skinned and they were being exploited by white people, the, namely the French. And they rose up, as you stated, to overcome and to fight against this and became the first uh, black republic in the world. And so I want, to, I want you to speak on that, speak on, you know, speak on it from the perspective of these dark skinned people coming from Africa, being exploited in, in, in this in this nation and also I want to I want to also pay homage to as well to uh, Frank Hoyce. I, I might be mispronouncing his name McCandall I think that's his name because <laughs> he was uh, Toussaint's predecessor and uh, he was a voodoo priest that he was actually one of the people in, in the 1750s he was one of the people that initiated some of the first revolts that led up to the revolution and I do believe that Toussaint and others were inspired by him as well. And also, I want you to talk about the role of religion, the voodoo religion, because that is something that really propelled the revolution. So take it away. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Sierra Leone and, uh, you know, talking about the Congo. Now I want to kind of give, you know, kind of rewind back to what I was saying about uh, the homie, which is today Benin, Benin um, in West Africa, right next to Togo um, in Nigeria, you know, in that area right there. As a matter of fact, I had just uh, did a DNA test, African ancestry DNA test to find out. So I, I know my people from um, the homie, which at, at first I was like, you know, people just saying that because this, this part of Africa is actually where voodoo, um, one of the originators of the voodoo religion, voodoo, voodoo religion, um, V O D U N, and and that played a big part. I mean, voodoo to them it's like an everyday thing of life. It's, it's it's just like getting up to pray in the morning, brush your teeth. You know what I'm saying? Those are rituals. And so these people were, you know, these were warrior people that actually practice a lot of these these rituals. I myself never participated in voodoo, nor my family. I did have a grandmother that used to, though. So that's a whole other story. So shout out to grandma. You know, I got to give her a call after this. But the um, back to what you're asking me uh, regarding, you know, how people were treated, the racism, the darkism. Um, in Haiti, there were three classes. There was the, the white class. There was the, uh, the, the free class, people that, that were free. And then you had a, a, a third class of you know that which was created the the mulattoes mulattoes were the um byproducts of the white men who were sleeping with the black women now at the and uh, uh enslaved africans i never call our people slaves you know what I'm saying? i always say enslaved you feel me that's it's just a once i find out you know that when, when you when you 
title um, our, our ancestors as slaves, you make it as if they, they were born to that. That's who they naturally are, which is not. So they were definitely slaves for people who was watching. Um, th there was a class of people created when they started sleeping uh, or forci forcibly sleeping with the in in enslaved um, women. And so they created this class of mulattoes. Now, the mulattoes come out red, red skin. So they felt as if they were white as well because white on the island meant white privilege, white power, you know what I'm saying? Finances, um, connections. But they are, the, the French had in their um, contracts in the paperwork that if you were a mulatto, um, in their declaration is what they called it, if you were, if you were a mulatto, then you couldn't, um, you couldn't own any land. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't vote. But if that land was given to you through your parents, um, through your obviously white um, father, then you can inherit that land and then you can maintain it, but you could not go to France and be considered a, a Frenchman. So this caused a big problem because France was already going through their, going ready to go through their uh, French Revolution, um, you know, a civil war amongst their country. And now you have this class of, of mulattoes, mixed children, who felt as if they were white as well, that they they, they they needed to be part of France. And just to guys, give you guys a you know a number in your heads of how, how much the enslaved Africans um, outnumbered the Europeans, the, the Frenchmen on the island, you're talking about 500, 500,000 enslaved Africans in comparison to maybe 32,000 Frenchmen. So how is it, and how is it that you have 500,000 black strong women and men not able to fight um the, the the frenchmen what made them fearful to obviously there's they're outnumbered you know what i'm saying it's 10 to 1 so the africans will win anyway you know what i'm saying but that's how powerful um, the racism was you know it, it was it was built it, it was built embedded in their brain it's like an elephant if you tie an elephant up on a chain even that, like that for years, you take the chain off, they still think they're in chains because the power of the mind, you can condition it. So their minds were conditioned. But then you got a brother named Tucson who wasn't like that. Now he wasn't a mulatto, but he understood that his great, great um, grandfather was a king in the home of the warrior kingdom. One of the last kings, as a matter of fact. And so by him knowing that information about himself and him being able to read, um, he eventually um, bought his freedom. So he was able to, to be free, you know? And so he, he, he acquired land, horses. Um, he, was, he, was, he was a great equestrian, a veterinarian as well. He took care of all the horses and the animals. And he practiced a lot of voodoo as far as for medicinal purposes. So he understood, like um, George Washington Carver, he understood the um, medicinal uh, properties of plants. So he was very well known and he even became, what a lot of people don't know is he became a millionaire. So you're talking about a black man, love being black, got a black, black blue wife. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love hearing that. <laughs> you feel me? Had children with him, but he was rich. As a matter of fact, he didn't even want, he didn't want to be part of the, of the, of the war. He wanted to kind of like make his money. I'm not saying call him a coon, but he wanted to sit back and try to see if this thing will play itself out. But eventually he realized that he would never be respected and his people needed him and he had experience. Um, and, and, just, and just a quick little side note, back in 1779, you know, Haitians, there's a five, of 500, 40, 550, the numbers kind of vary depending on what source you read, but you have nearly 550 Haitians, free men from the free class, free men fought in the American Revolutionary War here in Savannah, Georgia. And so if, I, I'm in Atlanta, by the way. So if you guys never, if, when you come to Georgia, if you've never been to the Savannah, um, you know, go downtown, the, the, the town center, you'll see a big, nice, beautiful um, statue that they made of about five, six Haitian soldiers holding guns. You feel me? So that is a beautiful thing to see. Uh, I just want to put that out because a lot of people don't know the contributions that Haitians did here in America to help America win their freedom mm -hmm. against, you know, the British. And, 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 and check this out how sick the racism is. George Washington knew about this. Uh, Thomas Jefferson knew about this. But guess what? They gave France, these two presidents, the first and the third president, they gave France $250,000. $250,000 back then 
to, um, you know, to help the French beat the Haitians and the Haitians won anyway. So now what you see right now, how, how things are playing out right now, the world powers didn't even want to recognize Haiti until I think 1862. You feel mm -hmm. what I'm saying? They ignore it, but they, they turn their backs on Haiti. Why? Because they flipped over the whole power scale. You know what I'm saying? They believed that Haitians were always, and, just, and all Blacks were always, that we love being enslaved. We love the shackles. We love masses. We love kissing their boots, working in the field, working in the house. Like, this is something that we love. We love to be, you know, chained and whipped and castrated and, and all of that. Like, we have no sense. Haiti debunked all of that. Just like Jesse Owens did in the Olympics in Germany when, when, when Hitler felt as if, you know what I'm saying, Blacks were inferior and, and the Nazi, you know, people were, were, were superior. Jesse Owens annihilated that. Same thing, Tucson, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Henry Christophe did against the French and the world powers. Now they knew that people like Nat Turner, um, Denmark Vesey, these type of individuals were going to sprout out. You know what I'm saying? That's why they want to keep that information hidden. And what they say, if you want to keep information hidden, you put it in the book. As a matter of fact, this is a book written by Jean Bichard Aristide, one of the presidents of Haiti, one of the best presidents Haiti ever had, really. The first uh, democratic, um, you know, voted president, and um, written, you know, he's talking about Tucson, but you know, that's I, that's what I want to say, and I hope I answered your question. I know it's kind of like going off, but you know, I've been getting turned up. I see you good. getting turned on when I'm talking. <laughs> that big smile. <laughs> I love it. No, no, I love it. Um, just when you were talking, just to go back to this, the, you pointed out the systemic economic darkism because. Correct. The world powers for a long time, like you said, they refused to recognize Haiti and strangleholded Haiti economically. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by systemic economic darkism, whereby the world powers that are European, white, light, they put in place economic policy that does not allow a country that has a majority of dark-skinned people to progress economically on the world stage. Mm. It leads to so many different social issues. And I like the fact that you pointed out uh, uh, Tucson is, is a multifaceted man. Just like you said, he really didn't want to get engaged in the war. And, and, and one of the things now that I found that I, I talked to you about this, I, it was a contradiction to me, but I have to realize, look at these things through the eyes of historical processes okay. and what would you have done if you was there? So one of the things that, and I wanted to ask you about this, um, one of the things that Tucson did after they had won their, um, the, the slavery was over and they got rid of the, the, the French is he sort of forced um, the former slaves to go back and work in the fields. And it was, it was a situation where y'all see you smiling it, that that kind of tears at me because I understand you being you being they hating on you because you a dark skinned man too son he was a dark skinned man you beat these white folks and they mad and they won't help you and mm. so he had to the contradiction is, is that this dark skinned man who and you can correct me if I'm wrong he I believe he owned slaves himself uh, had to go back and kind of force these slaves to go back to sort of slavery because kind of that's what it was how, how do you feel about that like what do you what do you think about that and, and for me i just think that that's a symptom of systemic economic darkism and white oppression but what do you think about that no i mean i definitely agree with you when, when i first found that out I, I i was shocked i'm like man why would he go back you know and put the people back to slavery and reading you know further especially books like this one um what happened was he understood that okay let me rewind a little bit Tucson wasn't just an educated man. He was, he, what he used to do was he used to go to school with um, his, his slave master. Um, his name was Breda. The last name was Breda. Um, his son used to go to school in France. And so Tucson was the, you know, helper of the son. So I guess his son's slave. So as the son is learning in class, Tucson is in the class as well, but in the back. You feel what I'm saying? So he got to see um, not just education, but the finest education of the world. So he understood global politics, um, you know, global economy and, and, and trade, uh, 
ex import export. He understood that. So when him and on top being gangster, on top of that, uh, being a, a soldier, when the revolution was over, he understood that hey, we need to get some some things shipped out here so we can get some money coming back into the country. And so you know, being that our ancestors uh, were you know they were war they were you know descendants of warriors. So they can be a little bit stubborn. You know, if you think about it, you, you know, you've been enslaved 20, 30, 50 years, and all of a sudden you got your freedom, you, you want to chill. So I'm and me knowing my people, my Haitian people, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love my people. We can be very stubborn. It's black people can be very stubborn, period. But I truly believe that the people were stubborn and did not want to work. So he he had to find a way to get them to, 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 to get back to work. Uh, which unfortunately it, it was slavery, but you know they were getting paid. They weren't just you know um, harsh labor and being whipped and um, be, be, uh, one of the, the worst tortures that the French used to do. Um, they used to bury the enslaved you know brother sister in the sand, with, um, neck high in the sand, and cover it with honey mm. or, or, or sugar or sugar water, so the ants could eat them alive. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So that that's the type of torture. Because there, there was no codes in, in the Caribbean islands. I don't care what island you was at. There was no codes. There's, there's all, anything goes. They will also um, put you in in, in a, uh, what do you call it? Like one of those big, big pots. I, I seen it in that movie. Uh, I never knew they had pots that big. There's a movie called Mandingo. Hmm. That's an off the chain movie. If you haven't seen Mandingo, Please watch it. I always thought that movie was about, you know, uh, you know, a uh, black man showing his penis. And that's why everybody keep calling their penis man dingo this and dingo that. It has nothing <laughs> to do with that. So I had this, I had this, you know, pre the conception of my in my head that that's what the movie's about, but it's not. But at the end of the movie, they put this guy in this big old tub of boiling hot water. You know what I'm saying? And so that and they still that's the kind of torture they used to do back in the day. Wow. So Tucson wasn't going to that degree. He would put him to work. You know, maybe apply a little pressure to the generals. Hey, they ain't trying to work. You know what I'm saying? Beat them up or something. But you know, he was taking care. You know, they they was taking care of to a degree. But he understood we need to export some goods. We if, if we're gonna survive on a global scale, you just mentioned it earlier on 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 the global platform. Um, which, by the way, speaking of speaking of the the farms and working on the fields, the reason one of the main reasons why Haiti is the way it is right now other than the fact that these other countries um, turn their back on, on Haiti, you know, purposely because of, of what happened, the rice business. Haitians eat rice like Chinese, you understand? We grow rice, we used to grow rice like the Chinese. We used to grow our own rice. Believe it or not, over 80% of the rice is no longer being farmed by the Haitian people. It, it is all imported. As a matter of fact, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, Haiti is one of the um, the largest importers of foreign rice. You know, the majority coming from the U.S. And what does that mean? It causes the farmers who made their living selling rice, they put them out of business, meaning that now they have to leave their farms, go you know, and try to find work in the city. That's why um, Port-au-Prince, was the capital of Haiti, um, is 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 overpopulated. You feel what I'm saying? Because the farmers no longer can make their money on a soil. And, and here's another thing, um, just, just to show how racist and how demonic these white devils are, they even, um, I went to a conference in Haiti in 2016. It was the um, Haitian American um, Study Association. They, they, it's from um, University of Boston. They, they, they started this uh, you know, organization. So every year they meet different parts of the world. That particular year, there was in Haiti. So, you know, I was there for the week conference, excellent conference. And the theme for the conference was, was about the environment of Haiti. So I learned not just the politics, which I already knew of, I learned about the environment, the soil, you know, the, the, the farming. The soil is, was purposely, um, they, they put toxic um, chemicals in the soil so that they can't grow their own food. They have to import it. You feel what I'm saying? That just, it, it, like, when, when I found that out, I was like, OMG, you know what I'm saying? Because the soil actually, in most parts of Haiti, is still good. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I mean, Haiti is beautiful. Forget what they're showing you on, on the television. Go to Haiti yourself. Um, of course, every, every, every city, every country got their poor parts. The media, which is run by Jewish organizations, by the way, they purposely put that 
um, poverty image in our heads, only focus on the, on the poor parts so that we, one, we won't go to Haiti to see what's really going on, to see how beautiful the people are and the land is, um, but also so that they can pillage, rape, and rob, um, you know, Haiti with the whole world watching. Because we think they're coming there for, for their good, but they're not coming there for their good. They're coming there to, to rob the country, and they're still doing it to this day. They just found over $40 billion worth of oil, gold, and silver in Haiti. How did they find that? They found it because they used that heart technology to cause that earthquake so they could shake up the land. Now, the earthquake happened in 2010. They found this, you know, this, this, this treasure supposedly 2012, 2013. Now, I presume that they've been found that oil and treasure. This is this is one of the, this is one of the the noise, the the anguish, the frustration um, regarding the earthquake that died down. Then make it known, hey, look what we found. And guess what, guys? Here's another tidbit. Hey, they didn't get none of that. They found all that all that oil and gold and natural minerals in Haiti. Yes, Haiti. They found all that in Haiti, and Haiti didn't get any of it. All of it belongs to foreign powers, the French, Japanese, America, the British. They all got hands in it. This, is, this isn't just, you know what I'm saying, some sort of like, you know, little scandal. This is a conglomerate, you know what I'm saying, scam. Like, this, this is what they do. And they, they're not doing that just in Haiti shit. They, on the French right now, getting paid, what, um, uh, millions of dollars every year from 13 different countries in Africa? Right now, as we speak, till this day. Let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. How did Haiti? How did Haiti win the war? Win the war against which war? Because we won many wars. Baby. Now, oh. now, let me ask you. As far as um, the voodoo, yes, dealing sir. with the voodoo, it was told that Haiti was using the voodoo against them and stuff like that. Am I right? Oh, uh, of course. I mean, voodoo is, is, is part of our culture. You know what I'm saying? It's so, part of the culture, so, yeah. so I'm asking now, if the voodoo worked then, why is not working now? Mm, I like that question. I like that. Let, yes. let me let me answer that. That's a good one. Now, yeah. the war, the war in Haiti. This is how they won the war. It wasn't just because of voodoo. This was strategy, as I mentioned. Over five hundred and something, uh, five hundred forty-five Haitian soldiers fought in the American Revolutionary War. Right. Now, Tucson wasn't part of that battle, but he, yet he was still a military strategist. So the way they won the war isn't just, uh, you know, a, a, B, and C, you know, answer. One thing, Tucson had horse stations, horse stations all over Haiti. So they could ride horses and pass messages and, and things of that nature. So they had a good communication system going on. One thing Black people, we need. So they, they knew how to communicate, hey, the blondes, blondes mean white. Here are the blondes over here. They're the blondes over there. Get this, get that. Change horses. You know what I'm saying? Another thing is biological warfare. There was, uh, I believe it was yellow fever. It was some sort of fever that the French would get when they was on the island. So off top, they were losing thousands of men. You know what I'm saying? Then you throw in the, 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 the aspect of Haitians being natural warriors. These people are first generation descendants of a warrior kingdom in West Africa. So fighting is in our blood. You feel what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you have those components. Now you throw in the, the, the voodoo aspect, the voodoo aspect of it, which our, our ancestors was heavy in that anyway, that gave them extra power. You feel what I'm saying? I guess you could say mm -hmm. supernatural power. So you play all these things together, plus the, um, you know, the, 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 the urge, the desire to be free. You know what I'm saying? Tucson once said, slavery anywhere is slavery everywhere. You follow what I'm saying? That's how much these people hated, hated being enslaved. And just like any of us will be, none of us want to be in jail or prison, but yet we got, what, a, a million brothers and sisters in prison right now in America. So you, you give them some weapons and see if they're going to fight, they're going to fight their way out, out of prison. Hmm. Yeah. I, I gave you a good enough answer, brother. <laughs> I just wanted to add to got that, you. that the, 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 the revolution actually started with the, the voodoo ceremony. Um, I can't think of the exact name, no, but right. started with the ceremony. It, the, <laughs> the, the, and I'm saying that because I feel like um, people like to cast a negative uh, light on voodoo. And they associate, I know everybody that I know, they always associate voodoo with something bad and something terrible. That's darkism to me as well. But the facts, the historical facts 
dictates, I think the, the guy name was Bookman. That's his name. I knew it was going to come to me. Um, mm -hmm. That one of the, the Maroons that was a part of the leadership that started that ceremony, that voodoo ceremony that kicked things off. So Black people down South, I know where I live at, St. Petersburg, let me tell you, damn near everybody I know talks negatively about voodoo. They'll talk negatively about, and I want to point the darkism out among dark-skinned people in the States that I've personally interacted with. They'll say, oh, that person uh, practices voodoo. I remember I dated a guy from Haiti, dark-skinned, handsome brother, back when I was an undergraduate at the University of South Florida. And people would say, why are you dating him? And they would come over to my house and him and his friend, we would cook. We had such a camaraderie. It was natural. They practice voodoo. And I'm saying, wait a minute. Do, do, do these people not, do, do, these, do these black people not understand that that same, the same, that same religion is what kicked off the freedom, the first African, uh, like you said, enslaved. I ain't going to use the word slave because I know you don't like that. The first <laughs> revolution of enslaved Africans that led to a free republic. That's huge for me. That's like major. So how can you denigrate and downgrade a religion that, so, so let's, let's, let's just suppose that to Christianity. People go on and on about Christianity and, and, and we, we use it as a, as a um, we propel it in terms of the American revolution. You, you know, uh, the, the Americans fighting against the British crown because they wanted their religious freedoms. So why can't we hold voodoo in the same esteem? That's how I see it. It's darkism. I see all, y'all got to understand, I see this all through the framework of darkism. I got to talk back to that. Take the floor. I'm loving listening to you. No, 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 you're right. You, you're exactly right. How can we turn our back on the very religion that, that set us free? Um, that location was called Boakaima. Um, that brought him on ceremony with Duda Bookman. As a matter of fact, Duda Bookman was actually, I'm not sure if he was born in Jamaica or was he uh, imported into Jamaica, but he came from Jamaica because he was an enslaved African who read a lot. That's why they, the Bookman is, is book. That's why it sounds like Bookman mm. because he read a lot. He's very educated. And he also helped train two some and the soldiers on, on, you know what I'm saying, different battle tactics. You feel me? Haiti was the first independent black nation. You feel the first independent black nation in the Western Hemisphere, um, and definitely the first and only country that ever turned to a state after the resurrection. So the whole voodoo thing, I mean, I, I've never, I've seen voodoo ceremonies in Florida before myself. Um, some of them really freaked me out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's another conversation, because I, I, you know, I grew up Christian, you feel me? I grew up Christian, right. my mom was a big gospel singer in church. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, I had that grandma that, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that was, she would do some ceremonies, and. It was very, very interesting. So I have a very interesting perspective on religion and voodoo and all that, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But, but to be honest, um, one of the things that, that I want to address, people, uh, I've read different, different places that they believe that the Haitians sold their soul to the devil. So that's, that's racism and darkism right there. So mm -hmm. because we practice our religion, that means we got to worship the devil. So right. what, so what y'all doing to the white Jesus? What's that? You feel what I'm saying? What, what, what the Pope doing with the kids? They, you know, you know, uh, 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 molesting the children is part of their uh, of their religion. So, um, if anything, they're the devils. You feel me? We just happen to beat the devil. So that's why you know they hate on Haiti and things of that nature. But mm -hmm. I really do like the fact that people are becoming more conscious and more aware of mm -hmm. the the contributions that Haiti and the Haitians had, you know, did not just for you know freedom of you know the people of Saint Dom Saint Dominique Haiti today, but Worldwide, one of, okay. yeah. One of the reasons why um, a lot of people over here feels that voodoo is negative mm -hmm. is because our people misused it. They they begin to use it on each other, mm -hmm. and this is why a lot of our people are afraid of it because you get into an argument, you get in with a beef, or you start hating on somebody. They say, you know what? I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a ritual on you. I'm gonna do some <laughs> something on you. I'm gonna do a voodoo <laughs> thing on you, and and this is what happens. So it becomes negative to us. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I remember one day. I mean, I mean, I remember this like it was yesterday, and I still don't till this day. As I'm growing up, my mother used to always tell me, Frankie, don't you dare eat any woman's spaghetti. Oh, 
now you know <laughs> I don't even need to go any further. She always told me, do not eat no women's spaghetti. How many of you brothers out there ever heard that from your mother going back? There you go, brother. That's what my mama always tell me. I don't need to tell y'all why. Y'all know what it is. But my mother always told me, stay away from them women's spaghetti. They will turn you out. They'll make you fall in love. They do all kinds of crazy stuff. So yeah, I mean, we just use it on each other now. And so a lot of our people are scared of that. They don't want to be involved in it, you know? And we don't know the science to it. It's really a, a deep science to it when you look at it, if you're using it right. Hmm. Yes, go ahead. Y'all can finish off. No. Um, I, no, I was just going to say, regarding Voodoo, I mean, you got um, you got Black Magic, you got uh, Santa Maria. Is that, is that what they call the Spanish call their, um, their, I guess, Voodoo rituals? I mean, there's all sorts of, um, you know, variations of it, you feel me? All the islands are practice voodoo, to be honest. If you, All the islands, I don't, whether it's the Spanish islands or the, the black islands, they all practice, you, you know, um, I've known people that's that's very heavily involved in it. You know, being in, in South Florida, you know, you got a big Spanish population, Haitian, um, you know, big African population. I mean, people, they, they do all kinds of things down there, man. I just don't want no part of it, but I'm not scared of it. I just respect it. Right. You know what I'm saying? As, as a matter of fact, my fear of voodoo growing up, that's what's, you know, just me being ignorant, that I was scared to go to Haiti as a little mm. kid. Matter of fact, I was wow. really scared to get on the plane. You know what I'm saying? But watching these scary movies like Serpent of the Rainbow, I don't know if you guys remember that one, mm. that scared the, you know, <laughs> the crap out of me as a kid. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not going to Haiti because that's all that movie was about. It was about voodoo. You feel me? But so those, those perceptions and ideas, you know, definitely count them because, uh, but I definitely like the fact that people becoming more aware of, of, of Haiti and the Haitians, especially my black um, queens and kings, like they, they, they giving me salutes when they see me. Okay, you so, all right, salute you, you feel me? So we just need to get back to, um, you know, not just focusing on the Haitian revolution, because like Dr. Amos Wilson always said, sometimes when you so focus on history, you get trapped in the past. Mm. So we need to use, what uh, success measures, what tools and strategies did the Haitians use to defeat the French and the oppressors and use that, that knowledge right now because we are oppressed. As a matter of fact, we are at war right now. It's, you know, I did a video on my YouTube called um, Are Black People Prisoners of War? Dealing with um, the Ahmaud Arbery case, you feel me? That proves the prisoners of war. These people could shoot and kill this black man, all, you know, for two months and don't get arrested. This is the America that we're in. We've been at war since we came to this country, believe it or not. And black people, we're the only ones that got no enemies. Everybody got enemies, you know what I'm saying? When you have an enemy, you know how to use your resources. You know how to strategize and deal with them. But the fact that we're so friendly, want to assimilate with everybody, integration probably was the worst thing that ever happened to the black community in America. Let's just, let, let that just be told. Um, we want to, we just want to be included with everybody, man. When instead of marrying our black queens, we're marrying white women. We're marrying, Hispanics, anything but a black queen, especially when we get our money right. But I'm gonna marry me a blue black queen. I would've told you she did that. I'm gonna marry me a beautiful black woman. She ain't gotta be Haitian, but Lord have mercy, let her know how to cook Haitian food. Learn how to do it, boy, that food be off the chain, baby. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, you you dropping some some major, major knowledge here. And, and just to sort of piggy, piggyback off of what you were saying about um, the fact that we need to, we can't be so stuck in history. And I'm one of those people, I love history. I have a bachelor's degree in history. I adore history, I can eat it up. But you're right, we gotta, we have to uh, move forward and apply what has happened in history to the current. And that's one of the things I also want to point out. Just I, I gotta I gotta hone in on this. Okay. Is again, um, the revolution over in Haiti. Actually, the slaves was freed over in Haiti before they was freed in America. I believe what it took to what 1865, 13th Amendment freed the slaves, mm -hmm. but our slaves was free like in the 1700s. So that's that started it. That spearheaded it. And so we we are doing that and we are moving forward. And what I wanted to, you to talk about next in terms of um, the systemic economic dark, I had some other questions for you too. I, I, I had a burning question for you before I before you get into that. No problem. I, you know, Toussaint, he went back when the revolution started and he 
um, helped his former slave master. I wanted for you to give us some insight into that because that was intriguing to me. I was kind of like, why is he doing this? But the next question I have for you or issues I wanted you to address is to get back to, uh, okay, we've, we, we know the history of uh, darkism in, in Haiti and how it started and how it began and it led up to the revolution and it led up to the abolition of slavery and independence and y'all did it first. So what's going on in the current situation with systemic economic darkism? I know you already talked about some of the stuff, but I wanted you to kind of elaborate on that to kind of bring us up to the current situation of darkism in terms of economic policies right now with Haiti. Right, right now there's a, um, Haiti is, you can say, at a standstill right now, especially with the coronavirus and everything. And, and, and everyone is just trying to survive right now. So we in the United States, you know, we, all we got to do is just stay home. We good. You know, in Haiti, they're trying to survive because there's nothing moving. Um, I just sent, I did send some money to Haiti last Friday, as a matter of fact. I'm going to do, do that again tomorrow. I got a cousin in the North Haiti. You know, he's from Miami. Well, he's from Haiti. They got deported. Um, you know, that, that gang I mentioned earlier, the Zopound, he was one of those gang members that got deported. Um, so shout out to him if he's if he listening. Uh, the racism um, is, 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 is still powerful. I mean, the, the red skin girls there um, or the dark skinned females who use the, the, the lights, the, the light, light lighteners, cream. Yeah, the skin you want to lightning call cream. Yeah. They're using that a lot in hate. A lot. You know, matter of fact, when I was in Haiti, I remember the, um, I was talking to this one one young lady and, you know, we were, it was raining. So she had to take off her shoes and now she's red skin. She took off her shoes and her, sh and her feet black. So mm -hmm. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like what? I mean, it made me laugh. And, but I realized what was happening. She'd been using this called Tropiclair. It's, it's a skin lightening cream. Um, if you have, if you have a light skin, you have a better chance of, not only getting married, but even survival and, and you know, hey, or moving up the ladder. You know, most people that I know in Haiti who are working in those, you know, top positions, which gotta be well connected, they're light skinned. The dark skinned mm -hmm. people are still working the, the menial jobs or just working on the farm. I mean, it's it's very real down there, you know what I mean? Um, and the 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 class system is still in effect. You know, if 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 if, if you're black, you're gonna be poor more than likely. If you're red, you're gonna be successful. You're gonna get scholarships. You're gonna go to school. So, um, it's I don't think it's going anywhere because, and I'm glad you asked that question because in Haiti, it was built off darkism. Right. It was. I'm saying it's it's literally in the soil. It's in the blood. It's in the trees. It, that's that, that's how it was built because one, you have the mulattoes who continue becoming presidents, continue having the big government positions. And they oppressed everyone else, not just because if you were um, dark skin, but yeah, dark skin, then you were more likely to suffer. You know what I'm saying? So that's not, to be honest with you, that's not going anywhere. What we need to do is figure out how can we make this current system, which ain't working, work. Because in about a couple of years, I'm going to get tooled up and go out and hate it, kick some ass, and become president of my damn self. Oh. You feel what I'm saying? Because I think literally it needs. Haiti needs someone like Toussaint. Toussaint needs to be resurrected wherever he was buried at in, in, in France, because they, they took him and they buried, they, they just starved him to death in, in some mountains up there in France. Right. But um, we need to get him, we need to, he need to be resurrected. And we need someone with that 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 passion, that fire to, um, you know, to lead the people again. And and like John Petrol Air Steve, he's for the people and not the money. That that's what that's what Haiti needs, because. There's so many scams like the 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 Petrie, the, the Petrie oil scandal going on right now. The president refuses to, to get out of the um you know the palace. He he wants to remain president even though he's part of that scandal. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars stolen, vanished. Nobody know where it is. And so that's going to cause an uprising because instead of the people getting the funds to you know start different programs or fix the roads or build the schools back up, you know what I mean? Or the hospitals, and, and people are frustrated, man. I'll be frustrated too, you know? And, 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 and just another thing is, you know, if you watch any time they used to give, give away the food to, to the Haitian people, what they'll do is they'll drop the food from the helicopters to, to land on the ground, like, 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 like they trash. And they know it's gonna happen. The people starving, there's no order there. It's people just reaching and grabbing, looking crazy. And they want that. 
That's the imagery that they want. Pro propaganda is a very powerful tool to manipulate the masses. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's what they want. That's what they keep doing. And to answer your question about Tucson helping as your slave master, um, Tucson was one of the rare enslaved Africans who had a, a slave master who was somewhat kind. If, if that, that's like an oxymoron, but he was somewhat, he was actually nice to Tucson, you feel me? You know, he, he gave him money, he gave him nice clothes to go to the, the school with his son, because he's with his son, he, he had to look good. So Tucson had a lot of privileges um, being enslaved that most of our ancestors didn't have on the islands or even here on the plantations. Hmm. So that's why he helped them he helped him get away, um, you know, doing the, the doing the revolution. And I was like, man, why would he do that? Because the man actually looked out. Tucson was a man of honor. You know what I mean? Like everything I read about him is nothing but good things. Nothing but good things. You know, other outside of the fact that he enslaved some of his people after the revolution, that's the only tarnish that I see. But if, if he had was given a chance, him being a blue black man, he would have put. He would continue um, the, the, the road system. Some of the roads are still there today because he already built some roads. Mind you, he traveled already now. He, 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 I think he's been to the States, but I know he's been throughout Europe. Um, he already built some roads, schools, hospitals. He was building infrastructure, the, the, the very necessary things that a country needs. If Haiti, if Haiti still had Tucson for another five, 10 years, I, I don't think it would have been the, to the shape that it is uh, right now. He was too smart for that. That's why they let him lead. Mind you, like I said, our ancestors were warrior kings and queens. So they're not going to subdue or, 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 or bow down to nobody you, unless you kill them or nearly kill them. So for him to be in the position to be able to lead and get everyone under one accord, that was amazing. To me, that's the most amazing part, that he got everybody with his plan. Like, look, we're either going to fight or we're going to die. But I need you guys to do this with me. And that's what he did. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it, it, that's one of the things I, I um, gathered about him. His personality seemed to be more um, diplomatic uh, to where he tried to bring people together uh, rather than um, just go at people and attack. He was trying to figure out ways to, maybe I can manipulate this situation here without having war, like war was the last resort. Won, right. that, that's the next question I wanted to ask you. Uh, Dessalines, to me, seemed to be a little bit more radicalized. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about Dessalines and his leadership after um, uh, um, uh, Toussaint ended up, like you said, over in France and he ended up dying in prison? Talk to us about what happened in the aftermath under Dessalines. Oh man, Jean Jean Dessalines was that gangster, man. He, he, he told everybody this, coupe tete, boule kai. And what that means is cut their heads and burn the houses. That was his orders. It wasn't no mix and matching. And anybody white, anybody white, kill them. So, so that's that's how he was. So he was darkism, but more on the side where it benefits us. <laughs> Because uh, you know, Jean Jacques de Saline was definitely the lieutenant of Toussaint Louverture, and um, Toussaint trusted, trusted him a lot, him and Henry Christophe. But um, de Saline had he experienced a lot more harsher um, lifestyle, you know, being on plantation. He was whipped a couple of times. Um, um, they, they they say that he, you know, they they tried to hang him one time. I, I read about that. So he had a different experience and a different anger towards white folks. Toussaint was killing the white folks during the war because it's war. Dessalines was doing it because, man, I can't, boy, I'm loving this. Like, he was bloodthirsty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that, that, that's the best way I can describe it. But he was a stern and fair leader as well, and the people respected him. And Henry Christoph is, is another um, person that also was diplomatic um, as well, just like Toussaint. He wasn't as educated. As a matter of fact, Henry Christoph didn't know how to read, and he was in... He was the first king of first and only king of Haiti. So his name changed to King Henry Christoph. And when I spoke about earlier, uh, I mentioned the, um, the American Revolutionary War. Henry Christoph was the drummer boy in that war. So he's seen war at a very young age. As a matter of fact, that statue in Savannah, he's one of the statues that's you know that they you know gave homage to, um, which is very beautiful. You guys gotta see it. Um, I'm gonna go back sometime this year. So because um, I'm with the Haitian American 
Studies Association, and so every year we we go to the uh, the statue to you know you know give a prayer um, and celebrate you know these brave men. I love it. Um, so now you said that you might want to become the president of Haiti. Yes. So uh, tell us about. I, I'm just interested in knowing what would be your leadership style if you did become, which is anything is possible, how would you lead? I mean, you got the example of Toussaint, who was yeah. more diplomatic, definitely educated, influenced by the ideals of the French Revolution. And then you have um, uh, his, his lieutenant, who was, like you said, turned up and ready to go. That's elite. So what's, what would be your leadership leadership style? Uh, I think, I, I think it, would you institute? I think I, I'll use a little bit of, of all three men, um, you know, because, you know, Tucson being intelligent, a people's person, uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines being cutthroat because you know you, you know you're in war, you you're in a tough place, you gotta be straight. And Henry Christoph and just building things, you know, uh, Henry Christoph built the city dial. If you guys have never seen the city dial or read about it, check it out. It should have been one of the seven wonders of the world, but it, of course it's made by black people, so they they didn't list it that. But it's a fortress built on top of a mountain. It's like you gotta you gotta walk almost an hour to get up there, man. Beautiful structure. Um, matter of fact, the painting is on my wall, um, but you guys can't see it, of course, but I bought a painting when I was in Haiti, you know, and this is something that I know that he has treasure hidden up there. So if I was be become president, I'll be trying to go up in there, trying to find some of that golds and bunions and, and diamonds, you know. Um, but on a serious note, I would definitely um, kick out all the current government governmental powers in Haiti. Like, they'll be kicked out or... Uh, strip of their powers. Secondly, I will build an army because you, you can't rule a nation without an army, you know, and and when other nations can't come into Haiti imposing their will on us, if we able to stand up and fight, you know, for ourselves and defend ourselves and defend our land. Um, another thing is, um, I like about what Tucson did, he got everyone involved. So I would definitely work towards getting everyone involved in cleaning up the Haiti. There, there's a lot of trash in the gutters and things of that mm. nature. Um, I see it myself. I, you know, I couldn't believe it. What, what I saw in some, in some areas, I would definitely get everyone involved. Everyone has to be. They have to feel that they're part of something. Hmm. You know what I mean, it, even the, the civil rights era, the um, the boycotts, everyone was involved. So we need that camaraderie, that meeting of the minds. When hmm. minds meet, and it's a beautiful thing. Like all three of us, me, you, and Sarnetta, our, our minds are meeting, and so we're building. This is what we need more on a larger scale. Right. Um, that's what I'll do if I, if I was the president of Haiti. And actually, I, I kind of play with that thought sometimes. But hey, if the creator gives me the opportunity, best believe I would not be one of these puppets that mm -hmm. um, are the president of Haiti, just going by whatever, whether it's the, the, the World Health Organization um, or if it's the UN, both mm -hmm. demonic entities anyway, they, 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 they all work, um, they all sleep in you know, bed together with the European powers. They're, they're started with the Europeans. So um, these these entities, I'll be kicking them out. The 90, the 90 million francs that France made, the Haitians paid for the reparations, which is equivalent to $120 million that um, that the French, I'm sorry, $21 billion. Um, 90, let me repeat that again, 90 million francs that the French made Haitians pay in order to be recognized um, on, you know, by the world as a country. Um, to make them pay for the French losing their farmland, losing mm -hmm. their property as an African people, um, mm -hmm. and losing money. They made the Haitians pay that, which put us in an economic slavery. That's the new slavery now. That's the, that's the, that's the sy systemic economic darkism that I'm talking about. I don't mean to cut you off, but I got to say something. Okay. The irony in that just is mind boggling. How Great. you make the, first of all, these dark skinned people work for you for free and made you all this money and you they they fight you fair and square and beat you and then you turn around and make them pay you reparations when you was exploiting them first that shit drives me insane it, that is the thing that makes me just uh that's what i mean by systemic economic darkism that's my that's that's a prime example i ain't mean to cut you off i didn't no, have to just jump in there when you mentioned the reparations how dare they the rep I, 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 insane darkism <laughs> no that, that's true you know what i'm saying that that 90 million francs turned into 21 billion dollars haiti had to pay these people man wow. which is crazy so we were never going to get back 
you know what I'm saying, to our glory days. That's, that's what it's all set up for. The whole thing's the rice. That's just one set. That's just one example. The mangoes. Haiti is one of the few places that the, the, the soil in Haiti is so rich. The mangoes grow nearly all year long. There's no other place in the world that does that. Some places, mangoes, like in Florida, mangoes grow maybe for two, three months in the summer. That's it. Haiti is almost all year round. We don't even control that. Other countries, foreign powers control that. So they want to keep us economically deprived so that we will never rise up again because they know this is the home of the people that defeated us. We don't want no no one else to rise back up like that again. So we're gonna keep we're gonna keep our, our fingers down on them. And that's why the U.S. the U.S. Um, France, but especially in the U.S. they have it supposedly written down somewhere to always have harsh rules and policies against Haiti. Mm. You know, feel what I'm saying? So, um, who fought is that? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Nah, man, it's our fault, brother. Okay. It's our fault that we allowed them to do what we they want to do. We are like their children. Oh, yeah. when in fact they are our children, <laughs> but they have reversed the roles and made us their children. Fact. Like they tell us how much money we could get, what we can grow on our land. Just like right now in China, in Ch in Africa, the Chinese coming over there being racist towards the Africans, telling them they are not allowed in certain shops in, in Africa. This is crazy, yo. You know, so I asked the question, who fought is it? Why are we still blaming the white man when the responsibility is us? We need to look at ourselves in the mirror. What are we afraid to die? We are afraid to stand up and fight like every other nationality in the world. You can't do that to the so-called Jewish people. They will die in them streets yeah. and fight for the rights for to leave their baby something. You couldn't do that to the, to the Arab people. They will fight and strap bombs to themselves. They will rather die before they let somebody else come over there and control their shit. Man. But we have become their children today. And a lot of us don't like to hear it. We say the white man, the devil, we talk bad about the white man, but goddamn, look at us. When are we gonna grow up? When are we gonna understand the powers of economics so that we can begin to leave something behind? We say it all the time. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad came and told us. Khalid Abdul Muhammad told us. Farrakhan told us. Um, I could go on and on, man. You know, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like none of these people ever existed in our lifetime because we hear it, but we don't cling to it. That shit go right out the other ear, and it's like we back to doing what we do. But don't you know right now, yesterday, started yesterday, the goddamn Chinese stores opened up in Harlem. Nobody out there protesting, except one group went out there and I filmed it. And, and the Chinese stores is open. They mm. making money from our people, knowing mm. that they was kicking people out of China, all black people, Africans. We don't care, bro. We are like they damn children. And so it's gonna continue to happen until we begin to raise our children better. So it's our fault. I blame ourselves. The white man doing what the hell he supposed to do. If if you are if you're gonna uh, if you're gonna um allow a group of people to just run over you and you giving them their money, they the bully. Yeah. They are gonna continue to do it until you stop them. They are never gonna stop until you physically stop them. And when they know that our people are ready to die for our children, they will stop. We tried everything except eye for an eye. We tried everything. We we marched, and then we got these um these bootlicking preachers and pastors that come to you and say, "Nah, brother, don't do that. We don't want to act like them." Mm -hmm. The hell, we don't. You want to act like them? You know what I'm saying? They need to see your eye. They need to see fear. They don't, they don't need to see no fear in us. But hey, I'm just saying the same thing that Malcolm said, that. Khalid said that Farrakhan said Elijah Muhammad. I could go on and on, man. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know? So, hey, we just going to keep going through this and we setting up the same thing to go down for our next generation because we ain't leaving them nothing. Go ahead, y'all. I mean, that's, that's fast what you just said, you know, and um, I, I guess I misunderstood your, your, your question, um, but you're definitely right. It, it is a lot to do with our fault, but Thomas Jefferson and George Washington they they set they they set that the president to you know for him for uh, Haiti to be in the position that it is right now, 
Now, one of the things I would say is our fault, when Haiti went through that earthquake, African nations, the black communities in, in America and the Caribbean islands, they all should have been front, on the front line helping Haiti. You feel me? That, that, that was a key, that was a pivotal oh, real quick. step in the help. Real quick, Alex Picks Gerald, Alex Picks Gerald says, saw they rounded up the Chinese in Africa and started deporting them good. <laughs> That's a good thing. Shout uh -huh. out to that. Go ahead, yeah, brother. I, I, I actually seen some videos about that. They, you know what I'm saying, catching Chinese, you know, um, you know, with the stores open or, or matter of fact, illegally mining in certain places. See, it's that's what I mean people. by, uh, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. about us standing up, doing what we supposed to do because we couldn't go in China and do that. You couldn't go over there with the Arabs and do that. But everybody could come to us and do what the hell they want open up businesses, open up stores, and we can't say nothing. But then when we got a group of people that go out there and, and protest them and try to shut them down, black people gonna fight us. Nah, move the hell out the way. I need some chicken fried rice, brother. <laughs> I'm going in. I need my chicken fried rice. My baby's hungry, brother. What are you talking about? So, you know, we got to fight our own people and then we got to fight them, but it's crazy. Go ahead, y'all. Now go ahead, Queen. Well, I, I just was gonna say that the irony of, of, of the, the question is that we've done it. We did it with the revolution, the, the uh, Haitian revolution. We, I think we need to go back to that. Go, but see, you gotta be willing to die. Hey, these people ain't willing, the slaves or the enslaved were in a desperate situation. And you know they've made it to where now there's been concessions that have been given so that the people will not rise up. I believe the, if you go look back at Roman history, you, you can look at the example of the patricians and the plebeians where um, they would put in place certain concessions so that the underclass wouldn't rise up. And that's what tends to happen in, um, in capitalism. They're not, they won't make it so hard. So for example, you got the stimulus package. I mean, you got the coronavirus going on People losing their jobs, so the stimulus, a concession. I see that. I see these things as concessionary measures to keep people in their place and to keep them from rising up. But going back to Haiti, you got this desperate situation where these people are being brutalized, uh, getting up early in the morning, working till late at night uh, in the sugar fields, working for free, being beaten. That's a desperate situation. So I think part of it is we are too comfortable. We need to go yeah. back to that sense of desperation that shakes you up and makes you go, okay, I need to do something about this. But like Sonata said, you got people worried about their chicken and their fried rice. <laughs> you got, um, I gotta be honest, black women, we, some of us are worried about getting our nails done. Some of us are worried about getting our weaved. I mean, it, I'm just, hey, I'm, I'm not taking no shot. I'm just saying what it is. And so that's the that's one of the problems. I think I, I gotta tie it back to the Haitian Revolution. We got an example right there. I mean, if it wasn't for the Haitian Revolution, they were free uh, for slavery before we were in America. Let's go back and draw off of that history and use it in the present day to take what we want. So I, I think our history provides the, 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 the greatest example of, of what we need to do is just take action. Oh yeah. I mean, just like Dr. Amos, Amos Wilson used to always say, history has a thousand answers for a thousand problems. And many of the problems we're facing right now, we can read about the Haitian Revolution, the Haitian leaders, and, 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 and find our way out of it. You know, one thing is how do we deal with um, police brutality, black on black crime, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, the, the abortion rates, you know, uh, these type of issues that we have going on in our community. That's what we need to be reading this history for, not just to get high and feel good. You know, hey, it's Black History Month. Black History Month is every month, you feel me? So we should be reading and studying these things on a regular basis and having these types of meetings so we can have a concession amongst each other on what we're gonna do about it. Okay, we see the problem, how are we gonna fix it? As a matter of fact, that's why I started the um, our annual Black on Black Crime Solutions Panel. This year will be our sixth one. Um, under my nonprofit, the Courage to Believe International. As a matter of fact, so I know you, you're in Harlem, if I'm not mistaken, man. I love to bring the program to Harlem or wherever. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm knocking on the doors right now, Chicago. But mm -hmm. due to the fact that we're in the quarantine, semi quarantine, uh, we, it will be delayed. But we host, I, I started hosting this program through our nonprofit 
because uh, after reading Dr. Amy Wilson's book, um, Black on Black Violence, Black Self Annihilation in Service of White Domination, and it, 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 it depicts darkism all, all in there. How is it that we are killing each other and it's because we don't see each other in each other. We hate yeah. ourselves, therefore I'm gonna hate the person next to me. And so it's, 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 it goes on, we can talk about this all day, all night. Just know we need to be solution oriented. So if we're not working on a solution, then what are we doing? And um, if I can, if there's a way I can help Haiti in, in whatever, a small or large way, I wanna do that. Anybody watching this video, uh, especially you involved in the government, Holla at me, man. I, I want to do something more than just post videos and, 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 and things on social media. I want to be on the front lines. And, and I love my people so much. And it, it means um, losing my life, then I lose my life. But guess what? I'm going to lose it fighting. Can you talk right. about... Um, it's just Hold up real quick. Oh, I'm going to just get this rid out right quick. Yeah. Not um, with the sad thing that we're going through, too, and don't understand it, we don't even see it, is that... um. Not only do the Chinese cook our food, fried rice, fried chicken, and all of that, not mm -hmm. only do they cook our food, they also do our nails, our women's nails, our women's feet. They also sell them their beauty products and they hair and the stores and all of this. They, it's like they have become the mother and we have become their children because mm -hmm. we depend on them to look beautiful. Mm -hmm. Understand what I'm saying? Not only have they been selling your food and your salam and giving you your wigs and your hair, they are also now in my community in Harlem. Don't you know that they also got the damn cleaning business now? The the um the cleaning stores and all that? The cleaners. Mm. Like if, I mean, I don't want to wear no dirty shirts. So sometimes you take it off, you gotta take it to the cleaners. They got the damn cleaning stores now. Mm. Did y'all know that? Oh yeah. Yeah, they I got the cleaners. They got the cleaning oh, yeah. business and all of that. And then Atlanta too. Yeah, yeah. And then when you were trying to get your head done with other people, then you got we got to deal with our African brothers and sisters. They don't want to share, but I can't blame them. We've been here all our lives, and we ain't got nothing. We ain't got no stores to set up. So something is mm -hmm. definitely wrong with it. Our people don't care. We are okay with that, brother. Go ahead, my sister. I just mm. had to say that. No, no, no. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you said that because those are those are excellent points. And I think that the biggest thing, it starts with our, our black people's mentality, like brother Kevin was saying, how we see each other. Because if we saw each other and respected each other, we would support each other. I am a person that supports black business. I've been doing it for years. I even sometimes if you got a bad attitude, I'm gonna excuse it because I understand. And what we have got to do is simply, I think that's where it's gonna start. Start supporting each other. If your sister or your brother has a business, I don't care what type of business it is, make it your business, try to go to their business you know, before you go anywhere else. It's very simple. Use your black dollars with other black people. Um, I just gotta throw it out there. I got a production of my play coming up. Let me tell you, I've been doing this quietly for years. I had a black young lady from Atlanta built my website, paid her a nice amount of money, raised it, because I believe in supporting black people. I am renting my venue from a black owned business. I'm paying a black cameraman to do my camera work. And, I mean, I practice this for real. And I wish that black people would do it. Black women open up a nail shop. And black women, if a black woman opens up a nail shop, go support her, provide good customer service, but go support this woman or these women. This is, this is very simple to me. We need to support each other economically. If we did that, that would eliminate a lot of our problems. Stop with all the worrying about how much money. They, I don't care. I want you to get all the money. I don't, that don't bother me. I like seeing other black people get money. I love it. I'm tired of looking at poverty. I, we are supposed to have wealth. That's a part of the elimination of systemic economic darkism um, and so that, that I'm fighting for is economic wealth. This is what we're supposed to be doing. I, I just don't understand why we will not support each other and while we hating on each other it's not necessary 
it is killing us. It's destroying us. The economics is really destroying us. And that, that bothers me so much. Um, I don't care what, a, what, what line of business a black person is in. Uh, I had a, a, a young black guy come and knock on my door. He was in sales. Listen, I never turn down somebody that's trying to sell, especially if they're black. I'm going to hear your pitch. I'm going to give you a chance. This is important. <laughs> These little things matter so much. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, so what I wanted to say, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted Kevin to talk a little bit about you actually do a lot of community work. You are an activist as well. You've done a lot with the children. You've done a lot um, in other types of social programs. You have done a lot. Can you just talk about the things that you have done and are continuing to do in the community to help black people? Uh, definitely. Thank, thanks for recognizing that and, and also for mentioning that. Uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> You know, our Black on Black Crime Solutions panel, that's something that we started back in 2014. And the reason why we, you know, we, we started that was, um, as I mentioned, reading Dr. Amy Wilson's book. But after we did the first one, we realized like, hey, okay, we spoke about the, the problems. We came up with some solutions. So what are we going to do about it as of right now? So we started the chess program, the C2B Chess Club and Mentoring Program. Um, you get all the information on my website, kevindorwood.com. And the, the chess program was, was so awesome because we are reactionary people. You know what I'm saying? We base our decisions and things we do based on our emotions and just reacting to things, which causes us to often lose in life when you're not able to strategize and plan. So when, I did, uh, when we did the chess program, the city, uh, different cities of South Florida, the, um, the, the police departments, the even judges started supporting and donating and even coming to speak to, to the children. So if you know my background, me coming from, you know, uh, being incarcerated, you know, felony record, things of that nature, for me to actually go from being in front of the judge to having lunch and dinners with judges, <laughs> it's, a, it's a completely different world, you know what I mean? So that's kind of respect that I was able to, to get. And the children, I mean, it's, it's a blessing to be able to plant a seed for them um, as far as inspiring them to be better, you know what I mean? So that's why we, we did the church program, uh, NASA, the, 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 space, the space company, NASA, even uh, sponsored one of our trips to the NASA camp in, in uh, uh, Cape Canaveral, uh, northern part of Florida, which was awesome. The children, you know, they had an opportunity to sit down and eat lunch with the astronaut. We, we, we missed that part of it, but as able to see astronauts, um, we was able to, we were supposed to be able to go see the, the, went there to go see a space launch of a spaceship. Um, I mean, it's just phenomenal program, and we're working towards bringing that here in Atlanta. So now that I'm here in Atlanta, my, my feet is firmly rooted in the ground. Um, and so the cities of Atlanta, I'm, I'm reaching out to different politicians and community leaders to get it going. I'm going to be doing, hosting the program and also Black History program at the local Boys and Girls Club. So definitely, um, you know, I will always donate my time to the community because I feel as if that's the rent I pay for my, my time and space here on earth. It just can't be about me, me, me. You know what I'm saying? Even though I'm going to be a multi-millionaire, not just for me, so I can give back to the community in a bigger way and, and to help produce plays like yours. Your play is what, June 26th? Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> yes. June 26th. Definitely check out her website. Uh, uh, what's the website again? Darkism campaign? Oh, uh, <laughs> darkskinactivist.com. Thank you. Dark, darkskinactivist.com. Definitely check, you know, check out our website, man. I'm going to be there in, in, in Atlanta when, when that's going down. I want to be there in person to, you know, hang out with you and, you know, maybe Thank go you. out and sort of eat. As long as you keep your hands to yourself, we good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, okay. Um, can you also, now you've written three books, three wonderful books. The Courage yeah. to Believe is my favorite one, and I would recommend that everybody get that book and read it, because this brother being humble, y'all, I'm telling you, he has an extremely powerful story um, of coming up. Um, the Curse to Believe is my favorite one, but you, you've you written three books, and can you please uh, tell people how they can get that book, how they can contact you? I know that y'all can go to his website, Kevin dorable.com once again that's kevin dorable.com and um get the books but they tell us the titles of the books and tell us about what inspired you to write those books because i feel like that's very important 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, words, you know, you you change the words, you actually change the world, you know. And and so with that, with that thought in mind, I want to get right quick to say how I got into writing books. Uh, when I was in the third grade, uh, my mom bought me an old school typewriter. So I use that typewriter, even though I was just playing around in the third grade, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm learning how to write and, and type out things. So that's how I actually started writing. Um, Cause I've always been creative and writing, writing my ideas down. Cause I still do it to this day. So these are the first two books. This one, The Courage to Believe. This is the one that I mentioned earlier. I talked about the rural bloodline, the first chapter. This is an inspirational autobiography about how I was able to overcome adversity uh, throughout life and just the, the help of the creator. Very powerful book, um, started everything. My name of my nonprofit is named after this book. Um, my, the Courage to Believe. The Courage to Believe International, that's the name of our nonprofit, our chess program, C2B Chess Club and Mentoring Program, which the Courage to Believe will come from. And also um, the documentary that I have coming out this summer called The Courage to Believe, Never Give Up, Keep Moving Forward. That, that's coming out. Go to my website, kevindover.com, and you can order. Do not order my book from Amazon. Black people, do not order my book from Amazon. Look at the book reviews. Don't get the book there, because they take 70%. My website, I get 100, 100%. So that's what's your what website it. again? Um, KevinDorval.com. Uh, K-E-V-I-N-D as in David, O-R-I-V-A-L.com. And thanks for asking that again. Um, Seven Tax of Queen's King Desire. This book has brought me all over the world. I've been in London twice um, because of it, uh, in the Caribbean, throughout the U.S. on book tours. Um, this book, every queen need to get this book. If you're a queen, you say you're a queen, you need to be reading this book because it really tells you what women actually have done and not wish they have done, but what women of power have done and what made them attractive to very powerful men. And also just the essence of a woman, you know what I'm saying? Being the mother guys, queens of the universe. Um, where does the, the mother earth concept come from? All that's in this book. And also where, where does that concept comes from? The black woman is God. I depict that in, in good detail. Thanks to people like uh, Dr. Ashimuku Shango who was the spirit behind me writing this book. So rest in peace to that, sister. And third but not least, this book, which is coming out in August, The Winner in the Mirror. This is going to get me on Oprah. Um, this is a book, uh, Activating the Superpowers, Mind, Body, and Spirit, The Winner in the Mirror. It's a book to help people that are struggling with their confidence. Um, I started writing this book because of, you know, the suicides amongst black males. Did you know that from the ages 5 to 11, black males are the number one population that commit suicides? Number one, we they outnumber the white the white children, so boys and girls, you know. So um, that, when when I found that 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 out, I was like, man, I gotta do something because I was actually working on another book, uh, which is the follow up to this one, Seven Types of Kings, which is coming out in twenty twenty one. So mm -hmm. I stopped that project completely. Cause that was just to get that that, that book is to get money. This book here is to save lives, the win in the mirror, and I think it's gonna do it. Um, I I have visions and dreams of Oprah calling me, so. Um, but pre-orders are <laughs> pre-orders are available, so, so check it out. You know what I'm saying? This this is gonna this is gonna change the game. This will really help people understand how to use their brain and not allow yourself to be conditioned by the world's or your society's issues. You know what I mean? Your your surrounding environment is how to activate the different parts of your brain naturally. You know what I'm saying? How to recall things, um, how to study. You know how to actually manifest your dreams and goals from getting them from inside your head to actually seeing them in a reality, you know? So that's what it's about. We all got good ideas. The richest place in the world is, guess what? Guess what the richest place in the world is? It's in the graveyard. That's true. A lot of people die with their goals and dreams in their heads and never actually go out to go get it because one, they're either timid or they don't know about their ancestors. They don't know about two solo mature owning all these businesses and uh, you know, having all this money, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? So they think because I'm, I'm, I'm in this poor situation, I can never get out of it. You know what I'm saying? But that's not true if you can change the way you're thinking and how you see yourself in the world. And that's what I, I do in that book. I'm very proud of it. Um, and just thank you again for, you know, giving us the opportunity to, to get on the show, uh, Queen Rashida. I definitely appreciate you. And your website is Dark Skin is Beautiful Campaign. Um, this is not about me. This is about you. <laughs> okay, no doubt, no doubt. So, 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 the, so we got the courage. So hold on, hold on, brother. Did you give your website and all that? You did all of that? Yeah, the KevinDorva.com. I wish we could have okay. put the screen up, get people excited to go see it. But check it out. We did, you just put up a brand new banner on the homepage. It's hot. 
um, the, the website and a good blog on there as well. So real good blogs to you know kind of read and pass through time, man. It's nothing but knowledge in, um, on my blogs, man, and my books, man. Trust me, I'm Beautiful. a multi-millionaire, and I'm gonna help companies and organizations like Sarnado Studio and Rashida Strober. I'm gonna help y'all programs when I do get this money. Y'all make sure you get contact me. Don't wait till I get the helicopter and be like, hey, hey, yes, brother, sir. Get in. you feel me? No, I, I know who look out for me, man. One hand washes the other, baby. Yes, yeah, sir. You're yeah, gonna I, get it. She yeah. gonna call you, man. Oprah gonna call you, man. Oh, of course. <laughs> you, should. Should. <laughs> you you also do um coaching as well. You talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, definitely life coaching, helping people um strategize their lives, time management as well. Um, as I mentioned, um what the book talks about how to get your ideas from, you know, your, your, your brain to actually having to manifest, you know, that's one of the things people get stuck all the time. I've met, you know, I've had clients who got money, got real money, but don't know what to do at that time because they're so caught up in just their work. So they don't know how to actually relax. I am a relaxation master. You feel me? I, you know, um, I meditate a lot. So I help people through the life skills, life coaching, either one-on-one -on -one through YouTube, um, videos or Zoom, one-on-one -on -one with Zoom, um, or just in person, you know what I mean? If, if the money right, I come fly to you. I don't care where you at. I got a passport. So I definitely li I like helping people, you feel me, and, and mentoring the youth. So the mentoring part is free. Life coaching part, you know, there's a fee for that. Also helping people produce their books. You know, people want to publish their books, so they reach out to me to help them coach them, whether it's from A to Z or just, hey, hey, Brother King, how can I um, get this printed? How can I format it? Or um, what should I call this chapter? You know, how do I copyright? So little I, little things like that, you know, I, I love helping them with it. Um, just, just holler at me. I help authors save thousands of dollars. If I had a book coach, when my first book came out, The Courage of Belief, I would have saved not only two years of a delay of my book being published, I would have saved myself $1,500 in editing and, and mm -hmm. these other, you know what I'm saying, frivolous um, fees. So Getting a book coach, spending spending a little forty, sixty, or hundred dollars on a book coach is well worth it. And I was being cheap back then. I had the money to pay somebody, but I didn't do it. And it was a sister I should have supported her business when she reached out to me to be my book coach. But now I'm returning the favor and helping people with their um books and in, in, in their films. So definitely hit me up, King Kevin in the building. Email me info at kevindover.com or just go to my website. Instagram, Twitter is at courage to believe. That's number two for the T.O. Courage to Believe. And yeah, King Kevin, we're here, baby. What's your website again? Uh, KevinDorval.com, K-E-V-I-N-D-O-R-I-V-A-L.com. I wish we was able to put it on the screen, but it's all good. I, we, we put it in the comment section. I'm going to have it in, uh, Sarnez is going to put it also in the description of this video. You know you're going to look out to put both our websites on there. Um, and I've always been wanting to work with Sarnetta, man. I've been mean, watching Kicking Dogs for years, brother. So you know, I'm happy to finally, you know what I'm saying, get the vibe with you. Next time I'm in Harlem, I'm going to come check you out. I, I was in Harlem in Brooklyn back in January um, in Manhattan at the Javits Center for like a week. So, but, uh, you know, I didn't, I, hey, next time I'm in Harlem, I'm going to come check you out. We can, you know what I mean? We can, we can hang out. Mm -hmm. You're on mute, Sarnetta. He's on mute. Okay. Oh, well, one thing I would say about this brother, uh, you all, he's a very good brother, humble. We've been um, networking for a number of years now, and his, he has a, a proven track record of working in the community, and I love people like that. Very humble, very giving, very intelligent, very knowledgeable. So y'all, make sure y'all go and support this brother. Once again, the website is kevindorable.com and get the books my personal favorite is the courage to believe i know i might should like the um the seven types of queens king's desire but i love a story of someone that comes up from nothing and makes it that's what i like so that's why i'm more attracted to that book but y'all gonna have y'all personal favorite so i'm just overjoyed to um have you know had you come on here and i'm so appreciative of Sonetta for letting us come on the platform. Thank you, Sonetta. Um, got a lot of respect for, for Sonetta, a lot. And I'm just like, I'm smiling because I'm excited. So thank you. Close <laughs> out, sister. You can close out. <laughs> Give right. your, um, let everybody know how they can find you and what's going on with you. Oh, just come to my, my website, darkskinactivist.com. Go to my website. Um, I'm easy to find. I'm on YouTube. 
And um, yeah, I just, once again, I want to say thank you, Sarnetta. I appreciate you. And I want to say thank you very much to Kevin Dorval. And I want y'all to please support this brother because he does amazing yes. work. I mean, I, we haven't even really touched the surface. Um,